you have so many great little tools that you can use to reduce those negatives and amplify the gifts that you have. Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudois, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Director of Marketing. Our goal is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. So this is another one of those episodes where Andrew is busy, he's out speaking, and it's time to record another podcast. But it's a little bit different because Andrew actually asked me to interview our guest today, and that is his son, Chris Pudwa. So Chris, Hello. thanks for coming. Thank you. The main reason, the main impetus for Andrew to ask me to please include you on a podcast is that he heard your talk that you gave at the Great Homeschool Convention in Illinois not too long ago. So he, of course, sometimes his travels takes him further than he even knows. And so he was out of the country. So you and Nathan King went to not speak in his place, but to go representing IEW. And you did a talk about your own story of growing up with dyslexia. So I am very eager to hear some of your insights that you had, maybe also just an insight that our listeners would like to know, what's it like growing up with your dad being Andrew Pudua? So you can start wherever you want, Chris. Tell me, what, tell me about just your life and growing up. I know that you moved out from California a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Were you born there? Uh, I was actually born in Idaho originally, okay. um, but I moved to California when I was about three. Oh, okay. Um, and then I lived in California up until I believe 13 or so, and then I moved to Oklahoma, and I've been mm. here since then. Okay. So for a while. To answer your second question first, what it's like growing up with Andrew Pudua, um, probably very similar in some ways to a regular, you know, dad who has a job. Um, but different in other ways. Uh, because he was starting his own business, he had to hustle and he had to travel long distances. He So he was gone quite a bit in mm -hmm. terms of uh, each month he would probably be gone, I would say a week out of the month total. Um, and that was pretty consistent throughout my childhood. So that, that was different for sure. But on the other side um, of that equation, what he was teaching was something that he could also bring to his family. So because he was researching education, because he was researching how best to to raise children, really, I feel like I was able to benefit from that to some extent as That's well. That's great. Now, did you have an opportunity to travel much with him? Yeah, occasionally I was able to go on trips with him. Um, but, I mean, percentagely, he probably went on 98 of his trips without me mm -hmm. or more. But, <laughs> but I, I went on a few with him, so that was always fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good. And so, of course, he has a few talks where he mentions his son. Now, when I say my son, blah, 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 that's kind of mysterious because I have three. Of course, he only has one son. So when he mentions his son, he's talking about you. Mm -hmm. Have you have you listened to these talks? I have listened to those talks. Um, he, he doesn't actually bring me up the most. Mm -hmm. He brings <laughs> up my older sister, Fiona, the most. <laughs> okay. So, so I, I might have second or third place in, in the category <laughs> of children. But yeah, he does bring me up occasionally. And I, I do think it, it comes down to the fact that I did struggle with dyslexia a lot growing up. So he brings me up as an example of dyslexia or how people get over it or how to, to educate with that as a factor. Right. Did it ever occur to you, wow, there are some things that my friends can do that I can't do because of something going on with me? What is it? Yeah, for sure. Every kid thinks they're different, mm -hmm. right? And in most ways, everybody's really similar. 
Mm. But dyslexics are different in some ways. Um, and I happen to be part of that group of, of people, and I'm proud of it, um, <laughs> which might sound weird because most people who are dyslexic are actually embarrassed about the fact, right? Mm. It's an it's impairment. You're not, able to, you're not able to engage at the same level as your peers almost immediately as soon as you start learning how to read, which is kind of the first step in most children's education. So I definitely did notice that. Um, I was homeschooled mm-hmm. for most of my you know, younger education. And being homeschooled, I thankfully wasn't in the public school system. The educational system has very poor accommodations for people with dyslexia in the current system. If you have dyslexia and you're in a public school situation, you'll most likely be put in with a group of special needs children. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. dyslexia is a very specific condition, which does have negative effects that cause you to need some more time, say, to read things, time to work through problems. Um, But... It also has a multitude of advantages, which are completely ignored by the public school system and not played into at all. So it's almost like you have a kid with the potential for something great, um, but they have some difficulties. And the school system holds them back because of the difficulties and never takes advantage of the benefits. So for our listeners, and maybe for me, describe dyslexia. What is dyslexia? Dyslexia is defined as a specific learning disability and I would put the disability in quotation marks. Mm. Um, I'll put my hands up right now, but you can't see me. <laughs> so it's a specific learning disability, which means that your level of IQ does not relate to your performance in a particular subject. So your ability to read vastly underperforms your IQ. And that's how they would define it. But dyslexia is a much more complicated issue than that. It is kind of defined by the symptoms, right? Dyslexia is defined by a lot of people having difficulty learning to read okay. or difficulty spelling or difficulty with mathematics for, for some and even difficulty speaking for others. Hmm. And beyond all of that, uh, a difficulty with basic sequencing of information and retrieval of that information, oh, interesting. which can apply to any area of life. Um, and a lot of people don't have dyslexia and don't even realize it because they might have a subtler form of it where they don't, you know, they're able to read from a decent age, but maybe their spelling has always been really, really bad and they cannot remember directions at all. And they have to make sure that if somebody gives them uh, a series of orders, they have to have them give those instructions multiple times or write them down or record them so they'll be able to remember them because they know that they'll forget them. Maybe that person has dyslexia. All the symptoms being said, dyslexia is a neurological difference. So it shouldn't be defined by the symptoms it should be defined by the way that the brain functions differently. Okay. The dyslexic brain, um, actually, I'm curious, have you ever heard of microcolumns? Microcolumns. Nope. Yeah. So in the neocortex of the brain, there are these stacks of neurons, basically, which are referred to as microcolumns or mini columns. And I want to preface, preface this by saying I'm not an expert on <laughs> brain chemistry, but I do know a little bit about this particular area. Sure. Okay. So there's these stacks of, of neurons, which are microcolumns, and in between these microcolumns are axons, which connect them. And the further apart the microcolumns are, the longer your axons are, and the further your information travels. Hmm. For some people, those microcolumns are extremely close together. And that extreme closeness of microcolumns allows them to do highly specific, detailed work or know something very detailed about a particular subject. Um, this would be autistics, actually. Hmm. So autism is characterized by these microcolumns being right up against each other, a little bit thinner, and the axon distance is very short, which means that they can send electrical impulses in a very short period of time and it allows them to understand a whole lot about a tiny subject or okay. about a very specific. So they have this specific reasoning, right? They're able to see things very specifically. That's why you have people like Temple Grandin who are able to understand everything about cattle and the way that they, they function. And she was able to see into it very detailed, the specific situation. Most people, their microcolumns are further apart than autistic microcolumns and their axons are a little bit longer and they have to travel further, um, but they still have this ability to have this specific reasoning, right? And they have more ability than autistics to have a a lateral way of thinking as well, which can be very useful in day-to-day life. Helping you to know perhaps less things, but about more areas. Sort of, yeah. The length of the axons dictates how far you're able to communicate from parts of your brain. 
Okay. So the further they are apart, the more you are able to think laterally or connect various different subjects together. Oh, okay. The closer they are, the more you have to think specifically about a particular topic and zone into just one thing. Dyslexics have very distant micro columns. Their c micro columns are, I think, four times more distant than the average micro column. So there's a very large and statistically significant difference in the way that that part of the brain is organized. And the theory is that that distance allows them to draw from various different parts of their brain and gather information in unique ways. Mm -hmm. And something which you might not be aware of is that over 40% of entrepreneurs are actually dyslexic. I was just thinking that because yeah. you would have to be mindful of so many different mm -hmm. things when you're an entrepreneur. So Exactly. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the general population, it's said, said to be about 10 to 20% of the general population is dyslexic. And 40% of entrepreneurs are dyslexic. Okay. So there's a, there's <laughs> a large over-representation yeah. over in the entrepreneurship area. And that is because of that, I believe, because of that lateral way of thinking that they're able to connect things. That lateral mechanism of thinking also applies to basic functions, mm -hmm. right? So when you're reading, you're zoned in on a specific task and you're sequencing information very detailed in a very small space. Mm -hmm. Your brain has to be pretty isolated to do that. It's not trying to make connections to other things, right? Or it shouldn't be. But with dyslexic, it, dyslexics, it has to. They don't have enough of the, that processing power close together, so they have to try and pull things together. And that's where it gets confusing and why it's difficult for them to read. And there's, there's other ways in which the neurochemistry of dyslexics is different than that mm -hmm. of the average person. So, of course, you learned about what it means to be dyslexic much later right. than when you were first realizing, what were some of the things that your parents did to help you cope with this disability mm -hmm. or what accommodations did they make to help you grow up to be a functioning adult in society today? Right. I think, I think that, that takes a, a little bit of a story to explain. Oh, I'd love to hear a story. Initially, I think my parents knew I had some form of dyslexia, but did not tell me about it. And their hope was that it would go away pretty rapidly uh, as I was younger, and then, you know, as I grew older, we'd get less and less, and I would be able to just kind of have a, a generally normal education. For that reason, they didn't really mention it or bring it up, but I do remember a very clear experience, which was, uh, it was Sunday school at my church, and everybody was going around reading Bible verses. I think I was about 10 at the time, and at this point, I could not read, period. So I could stumble through some things, you know, I could get through and, and I could get through some basic words, you know, cat, bat, all that. But I couldn't really put together a full sentence, at least not out loud. I might be able to read it by myself if I go over it a few times and struggle with it. But I couldn't read it out loud. And as this circle got closer to me and more and more people were reading their, their verses, this just impending sense of doom and fear just consumed <laughs> me because I knew that I was going to be next and I was going to be outed in front of all of my friends and they were going to mm. realize I was an idiot. Mm. So when it came to me, I had to say, no, I can't do it. You know, I ended up passing. So I went back to, to my family after, you know, being called some mean names by my friends. Mm. Um, and I, I basically said, what's wrong? You know, like, I don't understand what's going on. And at that point, you know, I said 10, but this might have been more eight, okay. if I'm remembering correctly. Um, at that point, they, they kind of told me that I have dyslexia, and they showed me a website, um, dyslexia.com, which is actually run by the Davis Dyslexic, Dyslexia Foundation. And dyslexia.com has a list of remarkable people throughout history mm. who have had dyslexia. Mm -hmm. Looking at the faces <laughs> and having the list read to me, I, I visually perused it. I just didn't, you know, process. But, but you know, you sure. can recognize Einstein's face, right. you know. So I, I went through all these people. Thomas so Einstein was dyslexic? Yeah, mm. I, Einstein was dyslexic. Thomas Edison is a famous case of a dyslexic. Is this, that's actually a funny story because Thomas Edison's mom got a letter from his teacher one day um, and the teacher gave the letter to Thomas Edison and he brought it home and he wasn't supposed to read it until he handed it to his mom. So his mom picked up the letter and read it to him. And she said, the letter says, your son is too smart for this and we're not going to be able to keep teaching him because he's at a different level. So you need to teach him, teach him at home. Mm. Right. And so, you know, Einstein didn't, or not Einstein, sorry. Edison didn't think twice about this and his mom ended up teaching him. However, that's not what the letter actually said. That's what his mom told him the letter said. Oh, that's hilarious. The letter actually <laughs> said, your son is an idiot, 
and we can't teach him. And that was because he couldn't read. And there was no way for him to, to be a functioning part of the classroom. But his mom knew that he was you know, intelligent, knew that he had a gift for seeing things in different ways. Um, and, and she lied to him and told him that it wasn't <laughs> that. And I, think, I think for dyslexics, a big, a big factor of it is it's more than just the physical limitation that your brain gives you. It's the psychological limitation that you impose on yourself. Absolutely. Because if you're constantly surrounded by people who are superior to you in what seems like the most basic function of humanity, reading a sign or, you know, reading anything. I mean, think about how many times you've read something today, right? It'd be in the over, the, over 5,000 times you probably looked at a word, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Now imagine every single time you look at a word, you have an internal crisis, where you feel like you're not gonna be able to accomplish that. So in 5,000 times throughout the day, you would have looked at a word and felt insignificant and in inferior to the rest of the population. And that can take a huge psychological toll on dyslexics, especially when the educator or their primary educator, the parent or, or a teacher, doesn't realize that they're not going to improve, mm -hmm. right? Dyslexia can be improved. I'm not trying to you know, discourage people from teaching their kids, but that being said, it is a neurological difference in wiring, which means that they will always have a more difficult time doing certain things. Thankfully, we live in the 21st century, right? Calculators are a thing. You have autocorrect, you have Google, you have so many great little tools that you can use to reduce those negatives and amplify the gifts that you have. If the educator pushes too hard for them to overcome their difficulties, they'll just be more and more discouraged, more and more, lack more and more self-confidence, and, and that can result in lifetime illiteracy for some people. Chris, there's so many things that you've shared that I know are going to be helpful for our parents and teachers that are listening to this podcast, but I know there's still a lot more for us to cover. So I think what we're going to do right now, just in the interest of time and just kind of breaking this up a little bit is just pause right here and if you don't mind can we have you back next week so we can continue this conversation we'll do we'll do our best all right yeah sounds great thank you thank you thanks so much for joining us if you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, you can subscribe to this podcast in iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, or just visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcasts. Until then, on behalf of Andrew Poudoua and the team at IEW, I thank you for the privilege of allowing us to partner with you on your journey toward better listening, speaking, reading, writing, and thinking. Thank you.